and um, okay. so welcome to tonight's talk, which is fire resilient landscaping with native plants. And our speaker is Nikki Hansen. I'm Vivian Noob. I'm the president of the California Native Plant Society, Santa Clara Valley chapter, and I wanted to welcome everybody here tonight. And let me click here. And these talks are part of our native plant lecture series. And every talk is not just the speaker and the host. We actually have a team of people who makes these things possible. So tonight we have Stephanie Morris as our QA moderator. She's the one who's gonna be reading questions. Um, Barbara Hunt as our YouTube moderator. So Barbara is monitoring the chat on YouTube and she'll be taking any questions that happen um, that are typed into the YouTube chat and sharing them on Zoom so that Nikki will hear them at the proper time. And I'm also handling the technical stuff in the background. So all the Zoom, the Zoom and YouTube things, that's me controlling things. And if you are not familiar with the California Nat Native Plant Society, um, we are a nonprofit environmental organization. We were founded in 1965. We have over 10,000 members spread across 35 chapters all over California and actually even beyond the, the state and country border because we have a chapter in Baja, California. Our chapter covers Santa Clara County and Southern San Mateo County. And what the California Native Plant Society does is we are working to save California's native plants and their habitats. And we do that through science, education, conservation, and gardening. And uh, if you are not currently a member, we would love to have you join us. And um, if you do, in addition to helping our very important work, you'll receive two wonderful journals um, that one currently named for Mancha, but which is going to be named short, renamed shortly, and Flora, uh, which is a, um, so for Mancha has a little bit more of a scientific bent. Flora is more general interest topics. They're both really great journals. Um, you'll also receive our chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, which has interesting articles, but it also has all the information about our upcoming events and other things. So those are really nice things to have. And then you also get discounts at local participating nurseries. And it's really easy to join. Just point your browser at cnps.org slash join, and you can sign up online. And as I mentioned, this is part of our native plant lecture series, but that's not all we do. So we have quite a few upcoming events. Next week, we're gonna be having a virtual garden tour, same time, same place. Uh, so it is Wednesday, 7.30, one week from today. Um, two weeks from today, we're gonna to have a talk on the rare plants of the Bay Area by David Greenberger. He's gonna provide a photographic tour around the Bay. He's a great photographer and amazing botanist. I think that one's gonna be a lot of fun. And then every month our photography group meets, it's open to the public and they share photos of plants. If you are a photographer, you are welcome to join the group and sign up to share your photos. If you just enjoy looking at beautiful pictures of flowers, you're welcome to come and just look at flower pictures. Um, it's also a place that if you have pictures of flowers that you're not sure about the flower and want some help identifying, um, that's a place you can actually come and show a picture of a flower and often someone in the group can help you with identification. Um, and then we have a just added talk um, for the last Wednesday in June and, and it's about going to be about transforming your lawn to a garden through sheet mulching, a very timely topic right now with the drought. Um, for those of you who are thinking about getting rid of your lawns, join us last Wednesday in June at 7.30. And if you are not currently on our chapter news mailing list, I highly recommend joining. There'll be information on the next slide about that. Um, you can also find out about our events on our website, cnps-scb.org, and also in our meetup group on meetup.com. Just look for CNPS-SCB. Our news mailing list, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is something that I urge you to join if you're not currently 
on it. Um, it's just one message a week, but it will give you an update on all the upcoming events. And we don't just announce our own chapter's events. When we see other things that are going on around the state or locally that we think might be of interest, we include those too. So it's a great way to find out about both our chapter's events and other native plant related topics. And we have a nursery, our chapter has a nursery. We are currently on our summer schedule, which means we're not able to have plant pickups at the nursery. But we know that a lot of people are doing lawn conversions and they sometimes are having trouble finding um, native plants. So we've decided that we are gonna continue over the summer to offer delivery sales um, only for $250 worth of sales and above. Um, but if you do that, you can have the plants delivered to your house. So if you are interested in getting a lot of plants, um, whether it be a lawn conversion or something else, you can do that by ordering them in our online nursery, um, cnps-scb.org slash cnps-scb-nursery. That's a lot of letters. All you really have to do is just go to our website. The link is right there. And um, you can shop 24 by seven and uh, have your plants delivered. If you would like to get plants, uh, we also have other resources listed for doing that. You can go to our website uh, and right there at the bottom is the full URL, but you can also just go to the gardening um, menu option, which is right there at the very beginning of our website, go to the gardening resources, and there's a list of native plant nurseries as well as a lot, as a lot of other useful information. So I highly recommend looking there if you're either interested in buying plants from other nurseries, or if you just want some information about gardening, there's all kinds of wonderful resources there. And uh, as I mentioned before, these talks take a team. And if you are interested in joining the team, because really all you have to be able to do is click a mouse, use a keyboard, and excuse my parrot who is saying hello to herself repeatedly, um, you could, could be one of our group. So if either being a QA moderator like Stephanie, who's gonna be asking the questions, or if you wanna stay behind the scenes and just help um, transfer those questions, just send a message to one of our volunteer coordinators, Johanna Kwan or Madeline Morrow. Um, their email addresses are on this slide, but you can also find them on our website and on our officers and chairs page. And uh, just a matter of housekeeping. So everyone should have their microphones muted. I did mute everybody at the beginning, but those of you who have joined since I started, you may have your mic, mic's on, please turn them off at this time. Um, you can ask questions at any time during the talk by typing them into the chat box. Nikki, I mean, um, Nikki will answer the questions um, at her convenience. Barbara and Stephanie are monitoring the chat, so they'll make sure that your questions um, are, get that Nikki gets to hear all of your questions. We expect to finish by nine o'clock and um, this, program is on both YouTube and Zoom. It is being recorded on YouTube, so you can always go back and watch it later. It'll be available immediately, actually. So, um, And now I'm going to be turning it over to Nikki, and I have known Nikki for several years. I actually met her when she was the um, nursery manager at Grassroots Ecology, and I'm the nursery manager for our nursery. So we sort of bonded over nursery stuff first, but Nikki is amazing. And I am just so excited to have her here tonight. Um, she's recently started her own business and she's actually been, been in the business of native plants for 17 years. And she's worked as an educator and worked with native plant nurseries. Um, she now has her own business um, doing landscaping, focusing on fire resiliency and uh, her business is called California Sisters Landscapes. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Nikki, and um, very excited to hear your talk. Oh, thanks, Vivian. Uh, yeah, it's great to see all these faces, and I'm super excited to share this stuff. And I'm going to pause probably every few slides or so and just check in and see if there's questions. I have a lot of information to share with everybody. Um, and I also have a little bit of review 
on home hardening because if you live in the wild land urban interface, um, basically home hardening is kind of hand in hand with our fire safe landscaping techniques. So for those of you who live in that zone, it's just something I like to kind of make sure we're all up to speed on since it, those two things are pretty important as we head into even more of a hot, dry summer. So yeah, anyway, so I'm gonna start sharing and do this. Okay, does everyone see that? Looks, okay. So just to make sure, Vivian, can you, you guys can see the slides, right? Yeah, it looks good, Nikki, thanks. Looks okay, good. awesome. Just checking, just because you never know with the internet. Okay, so yeah, we'll just start with the basics and I'm kind of casting the widest net here because I don't want to have anyone left behind or confused. So I know for some of us in the audience who are probably pretty familiar, um, others maybe not so much. So I'm just going to kind of go over everything. And to start with, what is fire safe landscaping or I actually like to normally say fire resistant landscaping or fire resilient, um, but essentially it's strategizing kind of where your planting zones are around your um, home. It's all about choosing the right plants and we definitely will talk about that. Um, there, it's about interspersing non-flammable substrate kind of throughout your garden um, breaking up continuous vegetation. So those two go, go hand in hand and creating vertical and horizontal spaces between trees and shrubs and shrubs and ground cover. And then a huge one is maintenance. So <laughs> all my neighbors right now are all weed whacking those last bits that need to be weed whacked or just diving into it. Um, yeah, it's kind of all of the above. And then I also just wanna take a minute to acknowledge that there is this huge influx of interest in fire safe landscaping and making our uh, land more resilient, but there have been thousands and thousands of years of people living on the same land, living with fire and making it work and really expert at dealing with that. So, before Europeans and later legislature and the fairly recent history and forestry practices thoroughly interrupted cultural burning. So where you um, tribes use purposeful burning and controlled burns. Um, California actually experienced massive areas of burning every year, but the big difference between then and now is much of that, those areas were burned at a lower intensity. So not as hot um, and also many burns were purposeful, so much more in control. And native tribes around our state are gaining more stewardship autonomy, which is really great. And I hope that just keeps on and keeps on continuing to expand. Um, and this is also including the use of controlled burning to enhance habitat resiliency. And there's even tribes up north, like the Yurok tribe, um, which is actually where this photo was taken, who are working with Cal Fire and land managers and you know, have a co such a huge depth of combination of skills of firefighting plus land management plus indigenous knowledge. So yeah, just hoping that continues and continues. Okay, so kind of the first question I often get when I talk to people and go to their homes and try to help figure out a best strategy for making their area more resilient or resistant to embers is just where do you start? It's very overwhelming, especially if you live in a wild area where you have a lot of land or you're adjacent to a lot of land. Um, and really you start at your front door or at the structure. That's the most critical zone. And more and more research that's coming out is showing that that first zero to five foot zone is super key. And so that's partly why I go over some home hardening here. Um, because home hardening is equally important to making the home uh, a defensible space. And most structures ignite from embers, not flames. 
So really throughout this talk and also when you're looking at your lands around your home and planning, you're really thinking ember resistance. You're not thinking about a wall of flames because that's really not how most things ignite. And just briefly going over <laughs> this, um, these are the current zones that's recommended to think about. So in that very immediate space, zero to five feet, it's going to be, it's not yet uh, regulated as required, but it's highly, highly suggested and CAL FIRE will be changing that in the near future to being required that there is no flammable substrate in that first five feet zone. And this actually includes thinking about things like your doormats or your wicker furniture or um, recycling bins that might be pushed up against the house. So taking a critical eye, not just on the plants, but on the other stuff that tends to just get in that space. And then as we go out, this image shows that next circumference um, perimeter is the 30, uh, five to 30 foot zone. So there you get just, you just get a little less strict on the um, limitations but it's recommended to not keep wood piles in that space. And I spent a lot of my life growing up with wood piles being exceedingly essential because that was how we did our homes. So looking at this, I would think in the winter when it's raining, I guess you just have to strategize and have your handy wheelbarrow that you go back and forth. Or maybe in the wet season, you have your, um, your wood that you're going to use up more quickly right here in that zone and then by the time it starts getting warmer having it moved out but anyway our fire season is just getting it's more and more stretched out these days so in that zone we just focus on keeping trees spaced and shrubs kind of spaced and making sure things are tidy mowing weed whacking um, having low ground covers interspersing with the taller stuff and breaking it all up with pathways and then as you go out beyond 30 feet, and this may not apply to all homes because some places don't have that amount of space, um, that's when you get a little even less strict on how much vegetation can be there. And you prioritize, especially keeping your mature or deciduous or broadleaf trees over invasive um, species or pines and small diameter firs. And then since we are in this area, always dealing with sudden oak death, um, if you have lots of oaks interspersed with bays, this, this whole zone, um, it depends habitat to habitat and what the situation looks like. But if there's reasonably small bays or think bays where it's fairly doable to remove them and they're growing among um, existing healthy oaks, that is always a consideration since sudden oak death spreads not oak to oak, but rather oak to bay to oak. So removing that, that uh, the bays removes that pathway. Uh, and then as we kind of move on to more gardeny focused um, spots, there are some places around the home where it's pretty recommended to just avoid planting altogether. And this one's definitely a tricky one for me and my family. Um, so below windows, and that's because glass and heat, glass tends to crack. Um, and the thing you absolutely don't wanna do, which is kind of like game over with um, protecting your home from fire is having an entry where embers get actually inside the home. Cause once that happens, then it's really flammable and it's just a whole nother thing. And so uh, that is the bulk of home hardening is just making your home itself super ember resistant so they can't get in. And so that's why it's recommended not to plant at all below windows. And then within that same like five foot buffer, the other big one is mulch. Mulch is super, super important for our soil health and water retention and so many things, uh, mycorrhiza. But that said, it's really, you don't want to mulch in that first five feet around the structure. And then they also, different mulch acts differently. So not all mulch is the same. But also the way you apply mulch makes a big difference. So I often 
In an ideal world, it's best to apply mulch when you're going into the winter because that way it has all winter to kind of be rained on and flattened down, maybe even start decomposing a little bit um, because the flatter the mulch, the less uh, burnable. So fluffier, more flammable, and you can also alternatively water it in really well. Um, and then in big landscapes with lots of mulch, you try to mix it up or alternate mulch beds with more compost topped or gravel pathways or pavers as just miniature fuel breaks. And then fences and railings and gates and things near the structure. That is actually a really important one to think about. This is a gate that my dad made. He loves welding and working with metal. So that was awesome. Um, but essentially we needed a gate across here to keep my toddler with a little safe spot. And so we use metal because that way what some research has shown is that if that's kind of a vulnerable point because railings made of wood are kind of like easy kindling. And so having that fuel break so that if worst case the railing caught on fire, it wouldn't have a direct fuse essentially that attaches it to your home. So that's really important. But worst case scenario in red flag weather, or if you did have to evacuate and you still had a wooden gate here, you would just want to actually just tie open the gate. So just making that break between the surrounding fences leading up to the structure and the structure itself. Um, and then thinking about the landscape around you just as a visual, when I say, so there's kind of three ways a structure can ignite, which is embers. And that is embers traveling in the wind up to a mile in front of the fire, actually. And that's this picture of little embers traveling over unburnt forest and then landing on a roof or something flammable. The other way is radiant heat. So when a fire gets close enough that um, heat is, can be actually hot enough, even though there's no flames reaching that can ignite if there's flammable stuff here. And then the other one is direct flame contact. And that actually is sometimes what people really visualize with um, how structures burn is you're kind of picturing like, oh, that flame, the wall of flame traveling through and reaching the home itself. That's much less likely as the way the structure burns up. And in all of our fires, that is also less likely. That said, we get when you have extreme weather events and the fire is traveling really fast, that's a whole nother thing. Um, but the other thing to think about is when you're protecting your home and landscaping and just making the general area and surrounding environment as resilient as possible, the amount of time where the fire might, the wind might be blowing in your direction and it's sending little embers or things down on this area is much longer than the amount of time when fire would actually pass through. That time of the fire passing through only is maybe 12 to 15 minutes of the fire just traveling through, whereas the embers could be, you know, a couple hours. And then these things I listed here are the top six things that are normally recommended. And we are, there's actually some really good talks coming up specifically, I think that will address new research on really weighing the relative importance of all these elements. Um, but as far as the easiest thing to replace, it's often the vents. So we're making sure all foundation vents and E vents and um, attic crawl space <laughs> vents are all fine mesh of 16th inch to 1 8th, met, 8th inch metal screen. That's really important and that's a fairly doable thing to do. Um, but a big one for just protecting it is your roof. So having metal or tile as long as the tile has closed ends, asphalt shingle, and then metal gutters is a big one. So even if you can't replace the whole roof, if you notice you have metal um, plastic gutters, or just um, gutters and things that are falling apart or filled with leaves, just focus there. And then windows, ideally double paned, with one being tempered. Um, decks, this is one that's really interesting and we're gonna experiment with at our house. 
aluminum is becoming an option. And even if you can't replace the entire deck, just replacing the first few boards that are closest to the structure with aluminum is super helpful. It just breaks up that continuous um, potential fuel. And then eaves, this is an interesting one, having closed boxed in is really helpful. And then siding, which can just be super um, daunting to think about, but if it's possible to even replace the lowest three to five feet, that's super helpful. Okay, that was my like super fast home hardening rundown, but I just feel like I need to cover that because it is such an important thing. But let's take a quick moment to just check and see if there's any questions. Um, that was just a really fast rundown <laughs> review. Thank you, Nikki. Yes, this is Stephanie. So we actually do have some questions for you. We have about four to five questions. Um, okay. The first one is from YouTube. R.T. Kirsch asks, I have read that four plus million acres that burned last year is more in line with pre-European settlement patterns. How did they figure this out? That's a good question. Um, so that's there's kind of a whole, I've watched a few talks. This is not, so I'm not an archeologist, but a lot of the research and science, there's been archeological work where they've looked at a combination of things. And then you can also use, so stuff like um, old sites where people lived and kind of going, sifting back through the layers, finding, you know, layers of ash. Um, then trees are redwood trees are amazing because they live so long. So dendrochronology, where you take core samples out of the tree is kind of a really amazing, powerful tool and a way of looking back in time and seeing the frequency of fires. Um, so those are a couple things. There's other ways. It's not as much my area of research, but it's a really fascinating topic and I do know that that in combination with also, um, so, oops, I'm accidentally clicking on stuff, uh, just oral history and passed down information from tribal, um, different tribes of elders to the next generation. There's actually been quite a lot of knowledge preserved that way of just passed down information and sharing. And then there's also old journals, sorry, this is kind of a lengthy answer, but it is really interesting. There's also a lot of old, very old journals from early explorers who wrote lots and lots of notes. Um, so yeah, all those things mean, yes, they definitely know that this area burned very frequently. And the other big difference is, um, yeah, it is hard to visualize how that could be possible maybe, but another thing to think about is that people living here could do things where they'd strategize lots of different smaller burn zones. So even though overall there was a lot of area being burned, it was much patchier. And so you could, they had a whole complex cycle of burning areas in sequence so that every spot say in the oak savanna would burn maybe once every one or two years and then yeah it was just a really complex system and we're like slowly trying to catch up with that and it's hard to get back to that point since there's been this big gap in some areas where we've accumulated so much fuel but mm -hmm. hopefully that answers your question slightly perfect yeah thank you so much so our next question, we actually have two that are kind of along the same lines. And basically it's wondering about whether these defensible space guidelines apply to suburban homes in the center of, val of, the, center of the valley. And if so, center. how can okay. we, yeah, so like more suburban uh, lots type homes. And how mm -hmm. can we find out what level of fire danger our immediate neighborhood might be in as opposed to if we don't live on an urban wildlife buffer type space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I would say the bulk of these, so the bulk of these fire safe landscaping 
um, talks and presentations and also the CAL FIRE recommendations where they talk about defensible space is definitely geared for the wildland urban interface or areas where you're somewhat adjacent or near um, a zone with a lot more to burn more easily. The thing that's really, really different in an urban area is accessibility. It is such it is so designed by our grid and network of streets and homes and there's so many people there it's way more accessible than say a large forest fire where you have steep terrain or areas where you know the fire could start really far away from any existing road um, so it's definitely not the same level of concern with some of these things but that said, I'm sure kind of any firefighting personnel or people who are working in that field would still say it's really important to think about fire. It's just definitely not the same level. And the other thing that I always think about in an urban area where it's really different is you have a lot, you just have so much concrete that's already lacing the system. So those are all fire breaks that it's not equivalent to look at your patch of yard and compare it to the same size of a yard if you took that out of that place and put it say in the woods or in a meadow out kind of like in the area where I live which is up in Mohanda um, because the areas all of surrounding your yard have intrinsically all of these fire breaks with the streets and the roads and then our ecosystem as a whole kind of almost needs you to make the most out of your little urban patch. So yeah, it's all really interesting stuff to learn about, but it definitely doesn't apply in the same way. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. Okay. Maybe. So some of the guidelines about mulch or plants under windows might apply much more to a property that's in the middle of a woodland than a property yes. in the middle of the city. Yeah, yeah, I would, yes, exactly. So I would not go to somebody's house in Palo Alto and say, oh, you have to remove all of your plants within the first five feet. I mean, maybe I should be doing that if I was really um, cautious, but I'm not, you know, I'm speaking from my own experience and my own um from what I've researched, my opinions, I'm not speaking for Cal Fire, but I would say as long as you're keeping reasonably good maintenance, um, that's a huge one. So, you know, don't have a giant twiggy pile under your window because that would still be bad for your structure. But having, you know, a well-maintained garden zone below your window in Palo Alto, kind of downtown sort of you know, very urban area or Central Valley in a complex, it's just a really different comparison to say like a wildland where you're trying to just super prep your area for resistance to embers. Perfect, thank you. Let's, one more question if you have time. Um, yeah. One person asked, uh, Stephanie Prugo, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, asked, how do I know if, oh, I'm sorry, she said, um, her question was, what about leafy vines that are not dry? Would that thwart a fire or at least not contribute to burning? So if you were thinking about something you could put under windows or closer to that five foot zone of the house, does it matter if it's leafy foliage? Um, yeah, it's still recommended just that first five foot zone. And I think now I'll probably, is that the last question? Cause that one, I think I'll answer um, in just a minute when I okay, go Okay, perfect. Yeah, let's do questions. that. And then if we don't capture some of these other smaller- Yeah, minor... we'll have time at the, throughout. I'll, I'll pause again. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have other stuff time at the end too, if we don't get to everything. Perfect. Okay, but all good questions. And yeah, as we're going forwards, Yes, the bulk of this is geared for that wildland urban interface or uh, just wild, you know, urban areas are not as applicable for these exact recommendations. All good things to think about.
And there is landscaping stuff in here that's still applicable to landscaping with native plants in the urban areas. Okay, so now we're gonna go into these just sort of six different um, topics or categories with landscaping. Where to plant, choosing your plants, spacing. And remember this is fire resistant focused landscaping, breaking up continuity, maintenance and irrigation. Okay, so where to plant. Um, basically anywhere beyond that first five feet is fair game for plants. Uh, definitely ground cover and low growing is awesome. And there's also lots of different perennial native species that um, can be just mowed down or weed whacked down. Um, and many of those, they're perennials, so they live year after year after year, but maybe the above ground, ground portion of them dies back. And so that's that kind of plant where you can just quickly prune it back, rake up the excess, and that's things like goldenrod and California fuchsia and yarrow and creeping aster. There's lots of things like that that are really nice, easy maintenance and can be kept low or with really fresh this year's foliage. Um, shrubs, I adore shrubs. There are so many beautiful shrubs, but when you're thinking from a fire resilience perspective, you want to think sort of strategically and make sure the shrubs are spaced throughout rather than having an, a garden that is just all shrubs of different kinds. So the, with shrubs, I recommend scattering them in the garden or maybe creating little islands um, or thinking about your most important zones where you want them for screening or habitat. Um, and also trying to sort of space them further away from the house rather than right near it. Um, trees. Uh, so when I'm talking to residents up in the sort of more rural areas, often the people I'm working with are trying to look at reducing fuel. So I often, often planting more trees isn't necessarily what we're doing. That said, there can sometimes also be this opposite sort of knee jerk or, or fear-based, reasonably so fear-based reaction of really being very scared and wanting to remove lots of trees. And there is this sort of balance where if you have lots of trees, you want to prioritize keeping. Um, so keeping the less flammable options. And in fact, some of these trees are quite fire resistant. So often deciduous broadleaf trees are lower flammability than say conifers. So deciduous means they lose their leaves at some portion of the year. That's just part of their natural cycle. Broadleaf meaning they're not needle-like leaves. They have larger, broader, wider leaves. Um, and so think deciduous broadleaf, that would be things like maples and buckeyes. Uh, those are often considered on a lot of fire um, safe plant lists that are recommended by different fire safe councils and then oaks is another, we are very blessed in this area to have wonderful species of oaks. Oaks actually, um, so if, you, if you've ever tried building a fire, campfire, or fire in your wood stove, um, you and used oak, you might have noticed that the bark does not burn very easily. So I often would be building, adding wood to the fire when I was younger. Um, and maybe I'd pick a log with like a big chunk of oak bark. Our fire in that wood stove could get up to 2000 degrees. And even with that, I would find that the end when we're cleaning out the ash and the fire's all burned down, sometimes we'd still have remaining big chunks of oak bark. Oak bark is not very burnable. So if you have oaks, the thing to do is focus on keeping them if they're healthy and just limbing them up so you create a vertical gap between the forest floor or the ground level fuel and the canopy level fuel. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a bit. And then large redwood trees can also be pruned up. And in fact, they even kind of naturally do that when they're in a forest. Um, 
And you don't need to go to the extreme level of pruning almost every single branch off, which I have definitely seen where they've been kind of pruned into a toothpick. Uh, that's not necessary. And we know from seeing all those classic pictures of burned out redwoods that they are built to survive fires. And then, um, sorry. Yeah, so keeping scattered trees and limbing them and ground covers and spacing stuff. And then also where not to plant. So this is a lovely cute picture of a home, but it's also a really great example of kind of where not to plant if you are trying to make your home more fire resistant. So this one has, uh, this kind of answers one of those questions. It has a leafy vine. It's a Cecil Bruner rose and it's grown very big and leafy and it's covering a arbor over this deck. And that's the kind of thing where as gorgeous as that is, it's not gorgeous from a fire or ember resistance standpoint, just because the more kind of complex, um, more complex stuff you have around that structure where it can kind of like act as a nest where it can kind of catch embers and let them smolder, that's not so good, kind of the worst that is. Um, so where not to plant, it's, I'm, I'm going to say this again, but it's just be, with more and more research, we're kind of finding that first five foot zone is really that critical spot. Um, so trying to think about things that are less flammable there, either um, having your path, so often garden, most gardens have paths somewhere throughout, um, kind of the fire resistant standpoint of where to put paths is you'd prioritize putting them close to the structure and then putting all of your plants starting further out. Um, so that's kind of a nice way of looking at it. And then you could also do things like have uh, rocks or trying to replace the first couple deck boards. And then the next one is below windows, which we talked about because glass and heat cracks faster and that could create an entry point. So even if you are in the position where it's like you're trying to prioritize what to remove within that five foot zone and you can't or aren't quite ready to remove everything, just starting with below the window would be a good place. Um, and then also below Eve. So once again, like in that five foot zone, if you're not ready to take everything out, thinking about something if it's reaching up to the eaves. So like this picture shows the rose has climbed up all the way and kind of in under the eaves. And um, to be honest, I, my family, we could have put our house in this photo instead, but I found it a little embarrassing <laughs> just because we're kind of guilty. It's really hard to look at your home like that in this perspective and not get either sad or kind of scared of fire. We have this gorgeous old tree fern and it's right now grown up all the way and it's in front of a window and its fronds are going up under the eaves. And where my mom and I right now are strategizing. We're like, okay, we don't want to kill this tree fern, but we also want to make our house more resistant. So I, I'm just saying that because I really feel for this whole dilemma and it's not just as easy and cut and dry as it you know, sounds, um, but we're all in this together. <laughs> um, and then keeping tree limbs 10 feet off the roof. So that's really important of just making space. That doesn't mean you need to remove the entire tree whose branch is reaching within that zone. It can mean that you just need to prune. Um, yeah. And then there are some species that we really kind of focus on uh, targeting for removal. And these six that I've shown here are these top six most flammable ones to target first. So these are both invasive and flammable and not very good as far as habitat and providing habitat. So kind of these are the, <laughs> the top six to get rid of. So palms, palm trees, although they're called palm trees, they're not a tree, they're in the grass family. And just the way their bark is structured, their trunk, not bark, they don't have bark. Uh, their trunk is structured is basically that base of the palm frond that broke off and then layered and layered and layered. So it's this crazy, perfect catch it, amber catching sort of substrate, not substrate, but texture. And then it's also so 
each frond is leafy and there's often lots of dead stuff. So palm trees are a big one that's good to target removal of. Um, bamboo, I've talked to people who have been firefighters in the past and they often say bamboo is actually not a good one normally. Um, it does depend somewhat on the species, but it's bad also just because it's, it's hard to control. If you live near waterways, it can kind of get out and start becoming a problem with its invasive tendencies. And then because it's a grass, it's hollow inside. So that's more burnable and it tends to have stalks that just die off. And so dead foliage is, you know, dead plants are the most flammable kind of plants. So yeah, bamboo, acacia. Um, acacia, as well as being invasive, it's also one that once again, I've talked to fire um, people who are fighting fires and in that whole realm in Cal Fire, and they really don't like acacias for their flammability. And then eucalyptus, as we all know. Now, one of the interesting things about eucalyptus that I was hearing is after some of these major CZU lightning complex fires recently, they did burn through some large groves of eucalyptus. And um, I was talking to some people and they were saying, you know, some of the eucalyptus survived. And actually, you know, we've heard that eucalyptus are bad because they explode in fire and they didn't explode. So maybe eucalyptus aren't so bad. Well, actually kind of the eucalyptus, the reason it's most recommended to not have eucalyptus is not necessarily because we're worried about them exploding. Um, it's actually because they have, uh, so a combination of things. They're oily. They have sort of an oil. That's why they smell so eucalyptus-y. Uh, that's a volatile oil in their leaves. Then also just the way they're structured, this peely bark that just kind of peels off and gathers and doesn't break down easily. So they're, they create their own ladder fuels. So a way of fire going from the, for, the floor, the woodland or forest floor, all the way up to the canopy, they create this tinder that can lead it up. Um, the other thing about eucalyptus is they're extremely tall. So often you'll see them scattered among oaks. And if you were to visualize that area with the oaks and the eucalyptus burning, a eucalyptus, you know, like a canopy fire reaching a eucalyptus versus a canopy fire reaching an oak canopy are such different height differences that a eucalyptus could act as this sort of torch that would be able to cast embers far, much farther than if it was one of the native broadleaf or oak trees burning. The other thing about eucalyptus is each leaf being that sort of sickle shape often with like the gum trees and stuff, they'll, um, and having a kind of a thickness to it. I've heard that the eucalyptus, just the way their leaf shape is, often they almost can kind of create their own wind and that leaf can flutter down pretty far. And often in these fire weathers, there's enough wind where the eucalyptus act to spread embers much further than another tree like an oak um, because of their leaf shape, being able to catch on fire and then carry that ember further afield. So for those reasons, that's why eucalyptus is so flammable um, and targeted. Then the other one is juniper. Um, there are native junipers, but a lot of them in landscaping are not native in kind of that classic landscaping hedge style. Um, junipers are very, very flammable because they produce, tend to produce a lot of dead material kind of within the shrub. And there are some videos I've seen where it's almost comically fast just how fast that juniper bush can burn. So out of all these plants, the plant that the firefighters like the least to see near your home would be juniper. That would be the hands down, like get rid of your juniper, please. If it's growing right against the home um, from a fire standpoint. And then jubata or pompous grass is another one because it's a grass. So it burns hot and fat or not hot. It burns fast because it's so leafy. And then it's very invasive, um, this one, and it gets huge. And then it even has these fronds. So, yeah. And then these six are more invasive species to avoid, not just because they're invasive, 
but even just from a fire resiliency standpoint. Um, and I've put these on one page together and I have a little exclamation point, meaning avoid them, but I do not have the little fire symbol because these ones are funny. The, um, you might be wondering why they're even on here as avoid them from a fire standpoint. Because if you were to take individual healthy leaves from each of these plants, the leaf itself is not intrinsically more flammable than something else, but the nature of how they grow and how they affect the system as a whole and how they affect the ecology and the resiliency of the habitat makes the habitat more um, vulnerable to fire and not just fire, but pests as well and things, but we're talking about fire here. So like blackberries, the Himalayan or Armenian blackberry, these are not native. They're not like our, our California native blackberries, which stay low and have kind of flexible vines. These ones can form these whole thickets with giant canes that kind of arch over and then they'll have sort of a dead fluffy zone in the middle maybe over time. So it's the way they grow that makes them more flammable. Plus they can grow along creek banks too um, and even make riparian or waterway corridors which would normally not be a flammable environment suddenly more flammable because of this habit that they have of growing these big arching canes and then sort of dying back and it just makes it tricky. Um, this is called Canary Island St. John's where it's Hypericum canariensis and it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem, especially in coastal sort of coastal prairie zones along our, our coastal prairie habitat. So like as you drive along highway one, there's areas where you can see big area, big sections of acres and acres of this. And it forms, once again, the leaf itself an individual leaf compared to another plant might not be super flammable, but the way it grows makes this habitat, which would previously be interspersed with shrubs and then ground cover and grass, suddenly way more flammable because they have these giant up to 10 feet tall stands where it's upright cane after cane after cane of stems all upright, close together, growing with lots of air <laughs> in there. And it's just acres solid of suddenly this fuel bed that's just continuous. And that's the kind of thing that's bad from a landscape fire resiliency perspective because it doesn't have a patchwork where the fire will reach a point and then kind of settle down again. It just allows it to kind of carry through. Same with, so ice plant is another one where the actual leaf of a living ice plant might be fleshy and you might be wondering why on earth would I put that here? Well, it's the nature of how it grows. It tends to grow where it will form this sort of dead layer underneath that is flammable, but then that top layer will kind of grow over it and look deceivingly sort of green and fleshy. Um, and then periwinkle, that's just a, that one is just from a habitat standpoint, kind of really destructive. It tends to take over, it smothers other stuff. It's also kind of a water hog. It really likes moist, shady environments. Um, so it likes to just suck up the available water that's there. Cape ivy and English ivy, both really bad because they form continuous fuel bed and they also climb. So they'll enable what might be say a native redwood forest environment where without the ivy, say you'd have just a low growing lush ground cover and then a big gap but before you get to the branches. With ivy, it can grow straight up the trunk. So suddenly you have this leafy ladder fuel that grows straight up the trunk. Um, then with broom, there's all different kinds of broom, French broom, Portuguese, Spanish, um, Scotch. And it's all bad for a similar reason to the Canary Island, St. John's where, where it just forms a continuous fuel bed. Okay, that was, oops. So I would just wanna pause and see if there's other questions because I know that was a lot of information but those are some really key plants to avoid and sort of in-depth why, reasoning why. Yes, we do have a few questions um, and a couple comments. Um, Carol Peck commented that frequently the local fire department for your city is willing to come give talks about fire safety and some fire departments will even come to your house and give fire safety advice. So I just wanted to pass that on. And then we had a couple of YouTube comments um, from Robin Mitchell. 
about the Santa Rosa fires, um, which are good points because a lot of those homes were not really next to wildlands, but that firestorm was so hot and so windy and so intense that it actually burned, you know, right into the suburban areas and you know, impacted a massive Make area. It more applicable yeah. to all of this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I thought that so, was a good comment. That's a really good comment. And I mean, as we go in going forwards, our climate is shifting so much and we're getting these unprecedented weather events, which can lead to firefighting resources, as we saw last year, be so stretched thin that, um, you know, the kinds of situations that might not normally be so scary and um, overwhelming suddenly were a problem and overwhelmed the whole system. So yeah, that it's a good point of how I, if, you know, while our kind of number one target might be starting on these wildland urban interfaces, the next, you know, thing to look at really is also if you can, those more urban areas, because in big wind events, it's really the extreme weather events, which can cause those embers to travel suddenly way further ahead of the fire. So yeah, or just cause the fire to travel into areas or like in Oregon, where it traveled through, you know, Medford and these places where it just, the fire just kept going even when it reached residential areas. So yeah, overall, the more fire resilient and resistant you can make it, the better. Yeah, and I think your point earlier on about ember resistance was really mm -hmm. a good way of thinking about it. So I appreciate that. Yes. Um, yeah. A couple, yeah, one other question, basically, I think you covered it, but just wanted to mention that it was also asked was the idea of well hydrated green vegetation or more leafy water, you know, vegetation that's that's holding water in it um, versus drier vegetation and sort of questions about whether that's something that should be a positive consideration when you're planning things maybe closer to your house. Yeah, yeah. that one is perfect because I'm actually going to talk about that in just a few slides. Perfect. Ah, good segue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, carry on. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, I, let's see, I just want to go back. Okay. So yeah, I just, so I just talked about a, two kind of clusters of plants to avoid, um, especially, but then I also want to highlight there are some plants that are native and they're kind of like the sample I think of as being especially virtuous. Um, for a few reasons. Uh, all of these are fairly fire resistant. So you can find them on pretty much all the fire resistant plant lists um, where they list different native plants. And then these are also just amazing habitat plants. So coffee berry and more than just also amazing habitat plants they are also really landscape worthy. And many, <laughs> native plant nurseries in this area carry all of these species. So not only are they, um, you know, growable in a garden, they look beautiful, they provide habitat, they're on fire resistant um, plant lists. But I think almost, you know, between all of our wonderful native plant nurseries in the area, you really can find these. So they're easily available. And that's coffee berry, which is an evergreen shrub which is really nice when you're landscaping. It's always nice to have some evergreen kind of foundation plants scattered throughout. It gets these really pretty berries. They're not edible for people, but they're edible for birds and critters who love them. And they're just really attractive. And it has the, coffee berry has a high, um, it's really drought tolerant, which is great for, you know, our climate. And then it also naturally, the, the leaves are very flexible. They have kind of a watery sap and they have a high water, um, a full, sort of a water content kind of in their foliage. And then pink flower and currant, these loose their leaves for part of the year. And, but they're kind of just a naturally very delicate, like just tidy shrub. They're, they're really easy to prune. So you can just shape them kind of however you want. And hummingbirds love the the flowers and lots of native bees like them too. And then buckeyes, buckeyes are a deciduous tree. 
So they lose their leaves and the, they actually lose their leaves early on the earlier side in the summer, but they get these magnificent blooms that smell amazing and so many different native bees and butterflies love them. Sometimes I have people ask me who are concerned about the European honeybees, which buckeye flowers are poisonous for. And I have talked to now a lot of different people who know quite a lot about bees. And also I've talked to, I've talked to people who raise honeybees and kind of the general consensus is that's actually not something you should worry about unless you had say like honeybees trying to survive, European honeybees trying to survive in an area where it was just really, you know, solid buckeyes or there just wasn't a lot of diversity in the foraging nectar sources they could get to um, and pollen sources because buckeyes, yeah, so just try not to be too worried about that standpoint. And they're just these incredible plants for all of our many, many different native species of insects. And, um, and then, yeah, the, they're really prunable. The only thing with buckeyes is if you want to create a nice space between ground level and canopy, sometimes I see people coppice down or cut down the buckeye to the base. And that can tend to make more of a shrub form which is okay, but then you'd have to space it more from other things. So try to focus on more delicately shaping if you're trying to get in, into a tree shape. Um, and then oaks, we talked a lot about oaks earlier about fire resistance and they're just incredible native, um, you know, habitat providers. And then maples, maples have a really naturally tidy form. And they also have nice spaced limb levels and these sort of tiers often sometimes. Um, they're just really easy to prune, pretty fast growing. So in areas where you might have like a lawn or a well-watered garden, they're very applicable to growing in that sort of garden environment. And unlike an oak, maples are just fine with watering every stuff below them. So perfect for sort of that garden zone or as an understory tree. And then toyons are another evergreen shrub and they just get these gorgeous berries around Christmas time and the birds love the berries. Once again, they're not really tasty berries for people to eat, but not toxic and, and really nice plant. And then these five plants are kind of these key habitat providers and they're all native and they're all really, you know, worthy of keeping in a garden or using in different ways in the landscape. And they're just worth highlighting these because of just how many different native insects they provide habitat for. So coyote brush, this one up around here, it gets a really bad reputation and gets heavily targeted for removal due to fire concerns. And it's interesting because I've talked to Landscape, a landscaper, Greg Rubin from San Diego, who's done a lot of landscaping probably for the past 20 to 30 years. He's a big long career of landscaping and he has done landscaping work in sort of chaparral areas and actually been able to see different landscapes he did survive fires. Um, and it's interesting because he was saying coyote brush is the fresh growth is actually really great from a fire resistant standpoint. It, it's not exceedingly flammable. And so it's kind of about maintenance or in a garden environment, you could choose a species or a selection or variety where it's actually a low growing form. And a, a lot of the nurseries, our local native plant nurseries around here sell that low growing form, either Pigeon Point, um, that's or Twin Peaks. And they that one's great because then you have coyote brush, which is giving, you know, 20, 29 plus species of butterflies and moths use the foliage to, as you know, a host plant. Um, and then when people have observed coyote brush when it's flowering, they found over 55 species of pollinators. So it's just a really great plant from that standpoint and birds also eat the seeds. So if you have the taller, just natural species of coyote brush, then the trick is just cutting it back every year or two. So it's that nice fresh growth and it stays low and tidy. Willow is an incredible one. Um, it's 
often in waterways or around places with water. So it has a naturally high water content. Um, it also responds really readily different certain species to cutting back. So if it's an area where you need to, to clear it periodically that it's forgiving as long as you're not uprooting it. Um, it's also just a fabulous erosion control along creek banks. So keeping willow where you can is great. And then it's this powerhouse as far as providing um, full fodder for, you know, to uh, just so many species of butterflies and moths. It's incredible, over 200. So yeah, and then see and note this, this one is just so garden worthy, a lot of different species. And there's, as well as the flowers themselves, just being such an attractive thing for tons of native bees and native insects and butterflies, the foliage is actually utilized by 95 or more species of butterflies and moths, which is just hugely important. Um, same with Douglas fir. I didn't really figure this out and learn it until about a year ago when I was starting to research fire resistant plants um, and came across like Douglas fir as, you know, 89 plus species of butterflies and moths. It's a host plant for it. So that's incredible. Um, and then oaks, as we a lot of us know, and there's been a lot more information on this, but yeah, oaks are just also powerhouses. And then the other thing to think about is you are not just providing food for butterflies and moths, but you are providing food for that foundation of the ecosystem because insects are supporting everything else, but below insects are plants. So really you're just, um, you know, by choosing the right plants, you're just forming this critical base in the whole food web. Um, and it's, it's really amazing, even in urban areas and the gardens that I have planted just last fall or this spring, I'm already seeing, you know, places where maybe it was just a hot little yard. Suddenly there's all these native bees that are coming in and butterflies. So nature is incredibly resilient but you have to have that base layer. Um, and then the birds, if you love birds, they have to have not just seeds, even seed eating birds, but they have to have that really, that kind of rich supply of plentiful caterpillars at this time of year for all their nestlings and babies, because those are just packed with nutrients, so yeah. All right, and then vertical space. Facing, when you're looking at the surrounding environment and this, um, as some of our viewers were commenting as well, you know, you can look at this in your more residential areas too, but thinking about spacing between the ground level and the canopy level, because the kind of fires that are low intensity and easier to put out and in a wild setting, even very beneficial, um, are the ground fire, the surface fires that stay low and slow and moderate and kind of skim through and are actually really healthy. You don't, the kind of fires we want to avoid are the ones that jump from the forest floor into the canopy. So what we're doing here by limbing off, cutting off these lower limbs is creating a gap. So suddenly there's a fuel gap and it's called reducing the ladder fuels. And by a ladder fuel, it just means the fire could climb like a ladder up into the canopy. And then there's this general rule of thumb where you are not rule of thumb, that's not maybe the best expression, but um, there's a general rule where you want to sort of aim in an ideal world for approximately three times the height of the shrub above that shrub to the first lower branch of the tree above it. Um, this picture actually kind of shows the shrub set away from the tree, but this is more especially important like if the shrub was underneath the canopy. I think it's just showing the shrub space just so you can visualize that spacing. Um, and then another interesting thing I found is with recommendations that minimum amount of pruning off of the bottom portion is 10 feet for conifers, 
so like pine, fir, and cedar, the needly leaved ones, um, because they have more resinous sap, they burn faster. So once again, if you're like starting a campfire, your wood stove, often you might use like, you know, finely chopped kindling that was pine or fir, because it's kind of pitchy and sappy and it burns fast. But then um, less ignitable, although once it's lit, burns really hot, is those deciduous or the hardwoods. So deciduous and broadleaf, oak, maple, bay, et cetera, the minimum recommendation for spacing between the ground and the first branch is six feet. So it's interesting because that's kind of an acknowledgement of that um, not quite as burnable ability of these trees. And then horizontal spacing, but actually this picture also shows a really nice example. This is on, uh, this is actually at Coal Creek, Mid Peninsula Open Space. I took this picture probably about a year ago. Um, it's just a really nice example of how the understory is all native blackberry. So it's staying nice and low, not like the Himalayan blackberry, it's staying all green. It was cut back, but not um, mowed or weed whacked to the point of disturbing the soil, which is nice. And then these are all oaks and they were limbed up. So it keeps the canopy intact and shady, protecting the understory, which is really helpful actually for keeping more moisture content in the understory. And especially in going into a drought, you don't wanna overly dry out this area. Also keeping an intact shaded canopy shades out a lot of our of our weedier species. So things like thistles and annual grasses and things that would make kind of flashy fuels um, are often a, like sun and disturbance. So the combination of being careful in how things were mowed back and not disturbing the soil and then also keeping a shaded canopy to keep that moisture content and then also shading out more of the weedy species is really nice. Um, but sort of general recommendations, and this is in sort of thinking about the wildland, because I know a lot of people live in those areas where you're kind of adjacent, or maybe you're helping with managing different wildland zones. But in meadows, it's generally great practice to sort of focus on keeping your meadow zones by cutting coyote brush and small firs to the base. So cutting them off at the bottom of the trunk close to the ground, but not trying to like uproot and not trying to use herbicides because those both cause different problems. Um, uprooting, trying to pull up the trunk isn't worth it. So cutting, cutting coyote brush to the base allows that plant to be serving as a great erosion control and keeping the soil intact and not causing too much disturbance, but it's also reducing that fire risk. And then firs, when you cut them to the base, they don't come back when you cut them below that lowest branch. So as long as you cut them flush, so you could mow over them, you're not gonna trip on them. Um, yeah, you don't need to go beyond that because they're not coming back. You have killed them. Um, so <laughs> um, chaparral, I have heard it's actually good to aim by thinning by 50%. You don't need to denude the whole hillside. Um, just cutting back by 50% is huge. And then also focusing on cutting once again to the ground, flush to the ground and not trying to just rototill or uproot everything. Often in chaparral zones, you're also dealing with slopes because those kinds of brushy hot environments are off, um, brushy heat loving plants often have these sort of sloped environments. So then erosion concerns are a big problem. So you really don't want to be like taking a masticator all the way down to the ground um, for those of you who don't know what a masticator is, that's like on roadsides or on hills, you have a tractor with a big kind of, <laughs> uh, sort of like a brush mowing attachment that can extend out on an arm. Um, it takes a lot of skill to operate those, but yeah, if you can not go all the way into the soil, then you're reducing the amount of erosion um, and disturbance. And then redwood and conifer forests selectively thinning those small diameter, more crowded saplings in the understory is really great for spacing trunks. 
but you're not thinning to the point of actually making big gaps in the canopy because that changes the whole habitat environment and opens it up and allows weeds to occupy areas they couldn't before. And then oak woodlands is a whole balancing act because we're often these days dealing with sudden oak death. And so it's all, whereas those oaks and bays used to be so cohabitable and really share that of mixed evergreen environment. Now we're trying to strategize as we look across which are going to be our oak zones and which are going to be our bay zones, just because in order to reduce the amount of tree death, from sudden oak death, you're trying to create areas where there aren't bays, which are what can carry that pathogen oak to oak to oak. To. So that one's tricky. And I know firsthand from dealing with my family's property where we have lots and lots of bays and lots of oaks and sadly lots of oaks that are dying. Um, it's hard and it takes a lot of time taking out bays, which can get really huge. So just strategizing. And then on spacing on slopes. So the steeper the slope, generally, the more space you want um, to have. And that's because if a fire is traveling up a slope, it goes much faster because of the um, because of the convection and the way the winds move up the slope. Uh, this little picture could even be my house. I'm pretty much on a hill that's really steep. There's continuous woodlands down here and the CZU. We were, um, yeah, less than two miles, a mile and a half from the fire edge. And of course the fire was at the bottom, <laughs> the hill where you don't want it. Luckily there was a road and a creek drainage, which was awesome. And people working really hard to hold it at bay. And then the re also it came down to just getting lucky and the wind shifted. Um, but then that was really bad for people down at the southern edge of the fire. So yeah, in this situation, you just wanna create gaps as much as you can if you're on that steep slope. Um, but that said, it's actually not necessarily beneficial to uh, create a gap as far as like removing all of the brush down this entire slope. And the reason for that is if you think about the wind carrying embers, you don't actually want your house to be the absolute first thing that catches those embers and slows them down. In an ideal world, I would strategize having a healthy band of oaks, say around here, and then a couple things maybe um, and then maybe a gap here and then more healthy oaks. You don't want it just totally bare because these healthy trees are actually gonna be your ember catchers. Um, so yeah, it's that balance of thinking kind of holistically. And then these are the general rules um, that are just increasing that amount of gappage <laughs> space. But that said, if you are in a closed canopy redwood forest, you're not going to want to thin to this point where there's actually 30 feet of space between individual trees. Cause that at that point, that's a totally different habitat. That's not a redwood forest anymore. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very habitat dependent. And a lot of these suggestions are very clear cut. So I know there's much, there's a lot of nuance place to place. Then the other thing is, um, and I realize this is, you know, we've had questions throughout, so it is a lot of information, but just thinking about creating gaps, so fuel gaps throughout your garden or your landscape, and you can do this in a really beautiful way. So like here is a dry stream bed um, or a rain garden. You can do that with paths or rocks. Um, you can do it by mixing up heights of plants. So creating areas where you can mow them. Um, and this just makes the whole system more resistant. And in a landscape level, you do the same thing. You want it to have that mosaic quality of having a habitat shift where it's not just one homogenous type of habitat. And the more mosaic and more diverse those habitat shifts can be throughout the landscape, actually the more resistant that landscape is not just to fire, but to disease because it's harder for a pathogen to spread as far if it 
um, doesn't have the same host it needs for miles upon miles, but instead, you know, maybe you have your your pines and then you have some firs and then you have some some oaks and then you have a little meadow so it, it just creates those gaps pests too as we've seen with pines um, sugar pines and stuff it's much harder for a pest population to build up to this massive amount um, this massive level if you have gaps in the habitat or not just gaps but like changes in habitat because suddenly you don't have that same level of fodder for those past pests who build up their population to this massive level. Instead, those pests can't travel and they can't build their population quite up. And then fire is connected to both these things because disease kills, pests kill, dead standing fuel is the most kind of flammable. So yeah, it's, it's all connected and the more resilient, the better. And then this is just a cool picture of somebody, their log cabin, and they did this clever thing where they had not first five foot stone, actually they have little concrete pavers. Then they use this cool rock retaining wall. Um, so it's really beautiful. And then also if you're in the house looking out, you don't actually even see this first five feet zone. Um, you just look out on this lush landscape and she has native irises and ferns and Yes, yeah, she is dealing with some ivy down here. But overall, this is this is just like really amazing. Um, so yeah. And then, uh, yeah, this garden is beautiful. It's Marge Disabler in Portola Valley and she's just wonderful. Uh, so then with your mixed evergreen forests, you're just thinking about habitat zones even within that. So these days, oak, madrone, bucket, you know, maples, kind of thinking about your bay areas. And then we have redwoods and firs and tan oaks and madrones, those kinds of sections. And then in the more riparian areas along creeks and waterways, alders and cottonwoods, maples, um, box elders, yeah. And then maintenance is huge. This one is just one of your biggest ways of making your garden more resilient. And that's the pruning, which we talked about, um, keeping your shrubs tidy and pruned, cutting back the salvias. Most salvias can handle a lot of cutting back up to 70%. Uh, coyote brush and sage, you can actually cut it down to a little stump a few inches tall and it will just sprout back with lush new growth. Lots of those creeping perennial plants can be mowed back or cut to just, you know, a little, almost the ground really. Um, and then mowing early spring, early summer, but not, so, but not mowing when it's like really hot, dry, windy weather because, or weed whacking, because then you could actually start a fire as you're trying to prevent a fire. So yeah, pay attention to the weather um, as we get into the really hot, dry season you wanna mow and weed whack either early in the morning when there's higher moisture content or much later in the afternoon. And keeping on hand shovels and things to put out fire if there was a spark caused. Hey Nikki, this is Vivian. And I just wanted to give you yeah. a quick um, warning about a time check because we're about 10 mm -hmm. minutes from nine to nine at this point. Yeah, sounds great. Um, and I will zoom through this last bit and yeah, essentially another thing that's really great to do is just add your compost and mulch to the, as the topper, just to retain that moisture in the garden beds and raking leaves from just that more close to the structure zone is super, super helpful, but you don't need to go to the point of raking the entire forest floor. <laughs> uh, leaves are very important, beneficial mycorrhiza need leaves to break down. And then weeding thistles and things before they flower and seed is super helpful if possible. And then irrigation, a final, our final point is just most native plants tend to like overhead irrigation and not so much drip. This one's really helpful to know when we're trying to um, plan our garden. And also just as a standpoint as fire resiliency, keeping your garden Adequate, adequately watered for the species that you choose is really important. So, um, and then the overhead irrigation is nice because it provoke, promotes evenly moist soil, which is really conducive to mycorrhizal. So the beneficial fungal 
plant root connection. Um, a lot of our native plants are adapted and depend on vastly expanding their root surface area to get more water from the same soil environment by having this hair-like thread network of uh, mycorrhiza, just because it expands their surface area of the roots so much. So yeah, evenly moist soil with overhead irrigation is really helpful for encouraging mycorrhizal networks. And then the other thing that irrigating, even if you do have drip, to occasionally do overhead watering, it's really, really helpful because it keeps the foliage clean and it washes off the dust. And that helps your plants overall be healthier and have higher water retention and just overall less dead stuff and not dusty and dry. Um, Cause plants breathe through their leaves. So the dustier the leaves, the, the harder it is for the plants to get enough um, uh, air and carbon specifically. So yeah, it's, it's just all connected. <laughs> so keeping the leaves really clean is really important for your keeping your garden healthy. And then as in order to compensate, because I realized drip is super useful for saving water, but you can actually save a lot of water by just timing the watering um, to take place either early morning or early evening super early in the morning is actually kind of ideal just because then the sun isn't out. So you don't let the water evaporate as much. You don't lose as much of it to evaporation, but the water doesn't stay wet on the leaves for as long. And leaves that stay wet too long are ten, tend to be more inviting or more happy habitat for some funguses and pathogens that you don't want to encourage. So yeah, it's, it's a whole bouncing app, but the best time to water is when you have time. So if you are just, you know, debating, like, should I not water at all or just wait for the perfect time or, you know, just water. So <laughs> do it when you have time. And then just a quick note on irrigation as well on drip. There are plants that do really like drip and those tend to be wetland plants or riparian plants and also plants that don't mind slow drainage. So a lot of our clay or adobe tolerant plants actually don't mind trip. Um, so that's good to know. And then you'll have access to these slides. So I won't go over that, um, but I have sort of a general guideline for plants that are really well suited to the habitat in your yard where they're really drought tolerant and you can kind of taper them off in those first, um, you know, couple of years or so. so to the point where then you wouldn't need hardly any additional irrigation. And then we'll just end by looking at a couple inspiring gardens where people are living and just applying all these different principles here. They've put in pavers. Um, this is a super creative use of metal feed, um, feed troughs or water troughs. And they have a pond and then it's, they have drainage holes in the bottom of these planters and it's also in some gravel. So that also increases drainage. It's kind of clever and they're metal, so they don't burn. Um, this is an example of a mowable meadow garden. And in the background, a nice detailed touch is that there's stone benches. So those are not flammable. So great example, shaded understory garden, nice space before the canopy and this lush undercover. Uh, not undercover, ground cover, uh, use of rock walls. This is a garden that survived a fire down in San Diego. This is one of Greg Rubin's landscaping uh, areas. And the fire actually burned up a chaparral slope and stopped when it reached the native habitat. So I'm um, not habitat, native landscape. So that's exciting. This is just showing that really well applied mulch that is well watered in and, and not fluffy. Even though it was next to the structure, it actually didn't even burn hot enough to burn these plastic flags. So yeah, that's cool. And here's a native garden at a fire station. So yeah, even fire stations feel comfortable doing this. And that's my garden. And that's where we'll stop, I think. Okay. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Nikki. Do we have time for a couple questions, Vivian? Yeah, Nikki, if you don't mind uh, going a little bit over, why don't we take a few questions? Okay. I don't okay. mind going over at all. I just okay. know that people have time frames. I wanted to get a good stopping point. I do want to just whiz through just really briefly and just show you guys. So the slides, when you get them later, I'm putting resources at the end so you can actually explore even more stuff on this that's more detailed. Home hardening, defensible space, plant lists. I have nurseries, a couple local nurseries, and there's even more nurseries. It's just I was running out of space on my slides, but there's grassroots ecology where I used to work and I know and love. Uh, Deanna's actually here as a guest tonight. Um, CNPS nursery with Vivian, Watershed Nursery over in Richmond. These are all some close by. There's even more like Central Coast Wilds over in Santa Cruz side of things. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of resources I put. And then I also have plant lists where you can click and go to CalFlor and see these illustrated plant lists that it, so yeah. Um, so yeah, let's go for questions. Very nice. Thank you for all those resources. Uh, yeah, a couple quick questions. So um, we had one, how do we reconcile the need for even small gardens to be native plant habitat for insects and birds? But essentially some of these smallest gardens would fall into the fire hardening zones where like essentially the entire garden should be a defensible space. How do you reconcile uh, you know, wanting to have some mulch and leaf litter and native plants in a small garden? Um, so me personally, and once again, I'm not talking as a Cal Fire person or something, but me personally, if I am trying to help somebody have a habitat garden in an urban zone or in a very small garden, I am actually go of the opinion that as long as it's well-maintained, I mean, you saw that picture of the fire. So let me go back that yes, make use of your space because I mean, every little bit matters and adds up. And if you live in this little space, you can get a lot of habitat value even in a small zone. And so I'll go back here, but look, so here, this is Greg Rubin living you know, down in San Diego in hot chaparral zone. This house was near a fire and it burnt, but he applied the mulch in a way where, so this is shredded redwood bark or gorilla hair actually, which is on a lot of things, uh, lists that say don't apply it. And what he says is think about how you apply the mulch. So it's very well watered in with application, which makes it fairly flat and compressed. And he made this really interesting analogy to thinking about metal as a substrate. So we all think metal, you can't burn metal. Well, that's not necessarily true. If you have steel wool, which is fluffy enough metal, you can burn that but compressed metal, you can't burn. So he was like, just think of it from a physics standpoint, like it's still possible to put some mulch in, but uh, just apply it really well and wisely. And then he also had some drip lines here and stuff and some rocks scattered in. And then, you know, if you were close to the structure, I actually worked with somebody up off Skyline and um, he was, you know, I, I informed him, I was like, so the recommendation is not to plant in that first five feet of space. And he was like, you know what? I know that's the recommendation, but I really want to plant in those, that first five feet of space. So let's just do our best to make a fire, really fire, super fire safe garden in that zone. And so I put together a list of plants where they're just they have almost no substance to them. Things like redwood sorrel, they're super fleshy. I mean, if you pick a redwood sorrel leaf, it's almost all water. And so if you pictured ember, as long as that garden is really well watered, he, we put redwood sorrel and woodland strawberries and polypody ferns and wild ginger. Um, and shout out to Grassroots Ecology and CNPS Local Nursery, because that is where the plants came from. But yeah, so we did this really awesome little, I feel pretty good about it, little fire safe garden close to the habit, close to the structure. So yeah, I personally am of the opinion that you can get creative and do some things where it's not causing an overly risky environment. That said, 
zone to zone, if you're in an area where you're really at big high fire risk, you know, I'm probably going to say let's as, as much as we want to plant right next to that structure, maybe let's try our best to not if we have space enough to prioritize planting elsewhere. So that's a lengthy way of answering your question, but I think it's a really good point. And I, I definitely work with that sort of balancing act. Yeah. Okay, two more questions. The first one um, is where does deer grass fit in? The question is where does deer grass fit in the zoning? But I think maybe they meant where does it fit into the flammability and how close can you plant it to the house? Yeah, I think both. I think zoning is totally applicable. Um, I would treat deer grass. So for one thing, so for those of you who don't know, deer grass is a native bunch grass, but it's pretty big. It gets up to four feet tall um, or the actual grass part is kind of like a three by three big ball of <laughs> leaves. Um, it's good to maintain it. So for one thing with all of the bunch grasses, you can really cut down on their flammability by just doing a good job on the maintenance. So once a year, um, cutting it back pretty hard and that way it's fresh growth and it gets rid of and, and just like uh, making sure to rake out and get any of the dead old fronds, um, leaf blades out. Um, the other thing with deer grass is you just want to space it. So don't have it, um, you know, if you could prioritize having it kind of further set back, um, maybe treat it like a shrub where you can have it sort of scattered throughout. Um, bunch grasses in general though, with the native bunch grasses, they tend to be a lot better than our non-native annual grasses, which are, you know, turning all our hills brown this time of year because the native grasses have really, really deep roots. They are perennials, so they live super long time. Some of our native bunch grasses live over a hundred years, um, super deep roots. And that because of that, they can retain much higher moisture content in their leaves through the whole summer, through the dry season, um, which changes also their whole way of growing. So instead of just bolting up and growing as big and fast as possible in the spring and then dying, which then suddenly leaves this super easy flammable tinder, um, they'll grow kind of slow and steady and keep their leaves as long as possible. And so, and then the way that bunch grasses often scatter themselves naturally in the environment is kind of space. It's really cool. It's kind of in these little distinctive clumps. And so it just overall vastly reduces the amount of fuel load in the landscape. If you compared an all native bunch grass hillside, say purple needle grass, foothill needle grass, um, yeah, bromus even, carinatus to say like, a hillside where it was just chalk loaded with the uh, European oat grass and different weedy bromes and all of that stuff. Where, it, so yeah, that's my little grass spiel. But it's a great, great question. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, one other question, and that is, what about some of the other high value habitat plants that you didn't mention tonight, like native roses, um, cream bush, mm -hmm. holly leaf cherry? and lupins, are those things that uh, you didn't cover because they're more flammable or just didn't happen to be on the talk? And is there ways to get information about some of these other plants yeah, that people might wonder about? Yeah, so it's hard because like I'm already out of time and I had to just cut it down <laughs> to the point where I'm kind of covering more. I tried to cover more of the principles so that you can sort of start getting an eye for what, how to look at the landscape and what we're thinking about, but I didn't have enough time to go into just, there's so many amazing plants out there that we can use and so many amazing local native species like bush loop, like many lupins. Um, so yeah, at the end, I have actually as a resource, some different plant lists where they have way more species listed of native plants that are on fire safe things. So let me see if we go here. Um, so here's just, here's three to start with. And then I also actually have, so I did for grassroots ecology, I made this, um, I made a blog and a webpage, same, same content, just sort of different format of fire safe landscaping and attached to that 
there's also a native plant, low flammability native plant list. Um, so that's actually four different native plant lists in here on these resources. So in my blog or web chat, so like going to grassroots ecology, they have that. Um, and then San Mateo Fire Safe Council has a pretty great plant list. Fire Safe Marin has really pretty extensive Fire Safe plant lists. Um, also, I found a really nice, super ex pretty extensive Fire Safe plant list for El Dorado County, but there's a lot of overlap, even though there's different species there, there's actually a lot of overlap with our species too. So yeah, um, but yes, lupins are a really awesome one. Um, holly leaf cherry, super great. Evergreen shrub, um, they're super easy to prune. So you can prune them as a tree or you can keep them low and bushy as a shrub and space them throughout. Yeah, great question. Okay, thank you. I think we covered pretty much everything. So since we're out of time and you've covered a significant amount of this topic, I wanted to thank you very much. I think we're good with questions. You're welcome. And I can stop sharing now and you guys can find this. Um, yeah, Vivian posted it. So you'll be able to find all of this content and slides to peruse at your leisure later. Um, and I think... Yeah, if you have any questions, I don't know. Oh, Vivi well, yeah, maybe Vivian, if you want, you feel free to post my email too, because I'm always happy to answer questions if people notice something or they find a link isn't working or yeah, whatever. Your, your email's um, in your slides, right? So I think- I am looking at that and I'm- <laughs> I thought I thought. So this um, is something I'm working on. I'm not the best self promoter. Yeah, um, yeah, Calsisters.com is on. Oh, good. It's at the beginning. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah. That's it. That would be a classic me mistake to just like forget that piece. Um, Thank you. That was really informative. We're getting thank yous in the chat. And I know we oh. are out of time, though. So I'm going to uh, maybe call <laughs> it an evening. But your slides are available, so everybody just feel free to download those slides. I will also post that link on the description of Nikki's talk and meet up on our website and on YouTube. So if you come back um, to review the talk, you'll be able to find that link uh, in the description as well. And that he's also shared her email and Stephanie just put it into the chat. So Nikki, you're well, you don't mind if people email questions to you directly or is that all right no I don't mind if people email me directly that is totally fine I really my goal here is just I would love for everyone to be as informed about all the options of how to simultaneously be these you know an amazing steward and caretaker of our land while also being fire safe because those two things are actually so they they can perfectly overlap um, they're not mutually exclusive whatsoever so yeah the more the more just the, our greater community community can be educated, the better. So yeah, please just go for it and email me. That's that's why I'm doing this. So yeah. And thank you and so Dudley, much. Yeah, Dudley this, was awesome. Somebody was like, Dudley yeah, your so. your talk was great, and I really we really appreciate all those resources are going to be very very helpful. And given what's going on in the world right now, I I mean it's just so timely. There's so many things that. Uh, you're going to be that this is going to help people with to be safer this yeah. year and in the future. Yes. Yes. Let's hope. Yeah. Let's just all be like cross fingers yeah. for yeah. a much yeah. better year. All right, nice. everybody. Well, I'm going to okay. draw it to a close so now. Much. So I'm going to be shutting down the zoom and Nikki, again, thank you so much for the talk and thank you, Stephanie and Barbara for taking care yeah, of the thank questions. Thank you guys for helping. Thanks and, uh, um, We'll be back next week with a garden tour. So good night, everybody. Yay. And uh, thanks, Nikki. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks. So nice having you guys here. Okay. <laughs>